all for joining us today for TASA's AMA, stands for Ask Me Anything. The first time I heard that, I thought it was American Music Awards. I thought, wow, we are really <laughs> making this big. But um, but I do want to give credit to Courtney Kawa. She, it, this was her brainchild for TASA to do these AMAs. Um, and we've been doing them for what, like two years now, Courtney, is that right? Or that maybe is, that's okay. correct, yeah. Um, so before we get started, uh, my name is Rose Luna and I'm the CEO of the Texas Association Against Sexual Assault. And we are extremely honored to have the guests that we have today. Today is not gonna be your ordinary AMA, but before we get started, I'd like to allow the panelists to introduce themselves. My name is Elena Bangs and I am a deputy um, division chief with the Tarrant County Criminal District Attorney's Office. Um, I'm, my name is I'm, Melissa. Go, Melissa. Go, Melissa. <laughs> no, my name is Melissa Winton. Um, yeah. I'm Tracy Matheson. I am uh, a mama on a mission. I'm president and founder of Project Beloved, the Molly Jane Mission. Awesome. And for folks who haven't joined the AMA before, my name is Courtney. I'm your member liaison at TASA, and thanks for being here. Back Thank you. Here. Yes, thank you. Thank you all so much. Um, today, again, as I mentioned earlier, this is not your ordinary AMA that TASA does. Uh, what we wanted to do today is shed some light on a problem that has been long withstanding. Um, today, we bring to you a series of tragic incidents um, with painfully obvious system failures in regards to adult sexual assault survivors. Uh, with these monumental consequences. Um, you know, as y'all know, TASA advocates for all survivors with a focus on adults. Um, and as long as I've been at TASA, there has been a subset of survivors who have been consistently failed at all levels. Um, this subset of survivors are adults who have been assaulted by someone that is not a stranger that's jumped out of the bushes, but someone that they recently met, a recent encounter or someone that they're familiar with at some level, maybe a friend of a friend they met at a party uh, or someone they met via a dating app. You know, technology is such that we're meeting friends and people through through apps. Um, so they may know everything. They may not know everything about them. So they are a stranger in that sense, but they are familiar with them and have some sense of trust and safety um, to have a conversation. Right. Until then, when it when they're betrayed when that trust and safety is betrayed by that perpetrator. And I think also what I want us to, to think about is how then as a society, we betray them for being human and having that sense of trust and safety just to talk to somebody. And then when they come forward to say, this happened to me, some of us have the nerve to say, well, why were you talking to me, Mark? Blah, 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 you know. So, um, so I am thankful to have uh, like a case in point, if you will, again, with a series of events that happened in our state uh, this this ultimate epic failure of our systems to survivors of sexual assault. So with that being said, I'm going to hand it back over to Courtney. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Rose. All right, y'all. So as you know, we have a few questions for folks who are new joining AMA. Uh, you can add your questions in the comments and we will take some time later on or as we go to try to respond, but we have some prepared as well. All right, let's get started. So, Tracy, a question for you. Will you tell us about Molly Jane and her case? I will gladly tell you about Molly Jane. Um, Molly was uh, one of four kids. I have three sons and a daughter. Molly uh, was number two in birth order and she took her role as the only daughter very seriously and used it to her greatest advantage. She liked to tell everyone that she was the favorite child. And, uh, <laughs> uh, which is not true, but that's what she liked to tell people. And <laughs> she, um, she was somebody that I, I called my best friend, um, and she called me her best friend. And that's a little bit unusual for a mother daughter relationship, especially, you know, um, well, I just, I, I knew it was special, um, in the moment. I, I now realize how very special it was. I, I, we did lots of things together, love hanging out, going out and having meals at various restaurants or going shopping or um, sitting and watching our favorite television shows. Um, she was my best friend, called her my right hand. And um, 
April 10th, 2017 is the day that I received the phone call um, from her boss saying that she had not shown up for work uh, and she was concerned. And so I'd hopped in the car to go drive over to her garage apartment that was not far from our house to check on her and got to the apartment and knocked on the door. There was no answer. I knocked again. There was no answer. I decided I would try the doorknob. I went inside and um, I couldn't, there was no sign of Molly. I went back outside. I'm getting a little frantic at this point and calling her name and um, thought, you know, I hadn't gone in the bathroom, so I should go back inside and check. So I walked back inside the apartment and around the corner to the bathroom. And that is where I found her body on the floor of the shower. And that's, you know, when I tell people this story, I say that's when the darkness really started spinning out of control as I'm trying to imagine what my 22 year old daughter who had been at my house the night before having dinner and was excited about the week ahead, um, what is she doing on the floor of the shower? And at that point, I, I realized I've got to call 911, but I can't figure out how to make my phone work. Um, it, I, I now understand trauma is very real and it um, makes a big impact. I eventually called 911 paramedics arrived shortly after that and confirmed what I'd already figured out. And that was that Molly was dead. And so I had to call my husband and give him the news that our daughter is dead, uh, which I did. And then eventually the detectives arrive on the scene to talk to us and, and let us know that, you know, nobody knows why she's dead, but they're going to be looking into it. And that they would be in touch, they figured within a day or so. Um, they called the following day, sooner than we were expecting, and told us that they had ruled that her death was a homicide, that she had been strangled, and that they also uh, believed that she had been sexually assaulted. And so, living in that reality in that moment, um, you know, she's dead, but then she's dead because of an act of violence. Um, was a whole lot to uh, try to wrap our brains and our hearts around and figure out what in the world are we going to do with this? You know, how, how are we going to move on with our lives when she has been basically stolen from us? Um, and that in and of itself was enough of a nightmare. But what added to the nightmare um, is learning that the individual who eventually was arrested and indicted for Molly's capital murder is someone who was known by multiple law enforcement agencies in the state of Texas for raping and strangling women and who had been investigated, who had been, you know, who'd come into different agencies, he had given DNA, he had, um, and, and nothing had ever been done. And, and so, while he has now pled guilty and he is in prison for the rest of his life, um, and, and we don't have to worry about an appeal, we don't have to worry about, you know, any sort of, you know, that's a done deal, that's a deal that's closed, we're, we're left with this other part of the story, and, and that's those system failures that um, I, I dug in and, and I founded a nonprofit to try to speak to some of what has gone wrong um, and, and to try to be, um, to be a resource to help victims of sexual assault, to help law enforcement in their investigation of sexual assault. But now that we have the criminal process behind us, I am 100% committed to openly, honestly, candidly having really hard conversations and illustrating these system failures so that we can do better. We don't have to keep doing it the way we're doing it. And the, the many women who were sexually assaulted in the years before Molly, who, who did their level best, they, 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 they did everything that they could do with the system that they had available to them and it didn't work. And so that's, that's kind of what brings me to the table today and I'm grateful for this opportunity. Thank you, Tracy. And thank you for sharing um, more about Molly Jane and overall the case. So my next question is for Elena and Melissa, what is your connection to Molly Jane and Tracy? 
So um, I am the prosecutor who handled the capital murder here in Tarrant County of, um, of Molly Jane. And so unfortunately, I obviously didn't get to meet Molly in life, um, but I did get to meet Tracy and um, David, and they have been in my life for five years, and it's been a huge journey. Um, I can tell you sort of how that process began for us um, is we learned about the homicide. It made big news in Tarrant County, a lot of because it's a young female and because it was near the college campus. And that struck a chord and it was at first there had been no arrest made. And so people get very, very nervous that there is a serial killer or a killer on the loose. Um, and so as I start talking to the detective and they start narrowing in on the suspect um, who is a known person um, to Molly, we begin to learn very quickly that just like Tracy said, he is not unknown to law enforcement that there had been several investigations that had occurred in the past in Plano, in um, Cameron County, which is South Padre, and then also in McKinney, Texas, and that they all involved sexual assaults and that um, they all involved strangulation. Um, the, I think a portion of it that Tracy didn't get to mention because it kind of that's where it ended with Molly is as that investigation is going on and as detectives are trying to talk to the suspect and get him in, they eventually do, and um, they're trying to develop probable cause, another homicide occurs in Plano, Texas. And um, and that person's Megan Getram and her body was found in Dallas County. And a detective um, out of Plano was able to connect that, and then eventually it also became connected back to the same suspect. So not only speaking to the serial rape aspect of Mr. Kimbrough, but then even one step further, when people were afraid that there is a serial killer, he was. Um, he had also killed Miss Getram. And so putting all that together and all of that, that's a very condensed version of how that happened. Um, but then as the as the five years progressed and as we got ready for trial, we also identified eight other um, women who were victimized by um, Mr. Kimbrough over um, when, that we know of, um, I suspect there are probably more starting back in 2012, um, which um, the first known report case that we have um, is Miss Winton. Um, and so that's kind of a good transition of how she knows um, Tracy. Um, yeah, so picking off of what she said, I am the first reporting victim back in 2012. Um, I was assaulted, choked, um, kidnapped, um everything that you can imagine <laughs> um being the worst um you know i went forward with the plano pd um and reported it um i mean honestly long story short they just really didn't care they didn't believe me from day one um there are multiple scenarios that had led up to me making that final decision of dropping the case um one of those, I mean, there were just a variety of situations. Um, literally every single time I had met up with my detective, I, whether it was verbal or written, I had to rewrite my statement or re-give my statement as to what had happened. Um, he had said that the bruises on my neck from being choked were from the zipper of my jacket. Um, when I would try to describe how um, I was assaulted, he would then tell me, my detective would then tell me to, you know, get on the floor and show him. Um, I mean, there were avert, multiple things. He, you know, running through my story with him, just detail by detail, he would ask me, oh, why didn't you scream? Why didn't you try running away? Why did you get back in the car with this person? And I mean... I was obviously threatened about my life, and so therefore I'm going to do whatever I can in order to save my life. Um, he had asked me to take a lie detector test after my assailant had taken one as well. Um, there had been multiple CODIS hits on all the different scenarios and all the different other assaults. Um, never once told me about it, apparently was told by some legal team, I'm not sure who, uh, to not tell me. Um, 
when he found out about the South Padre uh, case, he essentially told their police department, like, I could, our, my case could be of use to your case. However, you can't be of use to mine, which makes no sense because <laughs> um, it's the same behavior. It's the same everything. It's just, it, it, there's, it's the same thing. Um, after the plea deal, um, Plano PD is still choosing to say things such as um, alleged assaults, um, not really wanting to take accountability for anything. Um, and so here we are. <laughs> wow. And just a caveat to kind of where Melissa's case went is after the Capitol murders were filed in here in Tarrant County and Dallas County, um, the sexual assaults in Plano and in Allen um, and in Cameron County were then all taken back to um, those district attorney's offices and filed. And so when Melissa talks about the plea um, in negotiations for him to plead on Molly's case, he had to plead guilty to all of them, to everything, not one left behind, not one going away. Um, and he pled and took the life without parole to Molly's case, Megan's case, and then the maximum on the case in Padre and the three cases that were actually in Plano because another girl did come forward and report directly to police after um, his face was on the news after the Capitol murder arrest. Hmm. So y'all already kind of touched on this, but I kind of want to uh, branch out any, a little further. So you said there were other reported cases related to the case. How did y'all make the connection um, between y'all's cases? Like how, where, how long did it take for it to connect that there were this many cases related and to get us to this place? So, In terms of, oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry, continue. Oh, okay. Um, no, so I actually didn't find out about anything until um, there was the release of articles of Molly Jane's murder. Um, I didn't find out about the South Padre case until after the fact. I, I, I just then learned about everything. We knew um, of Melissa's case at the time that um, at the time that Molly, right after Molly was killed and he had become the suspect because um, we believed that there was enough probable cause and that a warrant could have been obtained for Melissa's case. We're still in the statute of limitations. Um, and then that would have been a way to get him off the street while we were developing, and we, the police, were developing probable cause on Molly's case. So I knew about Melissa's case. Once we obtained that case file, just as she said, um, that we do know that the detective knew about Padre and the other cases because it's all noted in his file. So as we started seeing that, then we were seeing the one that, because he was arrested directly in South Padre. That mm -hmm. was the best. Um, and then CODIS hits connected us to the case in McKinney. Um, and that was, a, that was a, you know, a DPS DNA backlog problem. So there's kind of another place. Um, the district attorney's office on the Cameron County case, the South Padre case, did not file that case. So... While the police did that correctly, the DA's office did not file it. In terms of the other eight women, that was after the cases were filed and, and we started investigating here and calling people and calling every person's name that we saw anywhere, we would always end our conversations with his acquaintances by saying, is there anybody else you think we should talk to? Is there anybody else whose name you think we should know? Um, and inevitably, um, all the people he were, was around since high school, um, it led to another person, to another person, to another person. And we talked to so many women who had stories and anecdotes and then also outcries of sexual assault. And they had only told only one other person their whole lives and said, how'd you find me? I mean, there was a lot of how'd you find me? Um, and that's sort of how we developed the other ones. And then finally, I, I alluded to, but another girl had called the detectives when she saw his face on the news. And so that one was the other filed case in Plano or in Collin County. Thank you. That That's a lot of uh, work to build that out. Um, so my question to y'all now is what steps or policies do you hope will be in place to change broken systems? And I think 
this would be a good opportunity to kind of talk about where the balls were dropped in regards to the, the varying cases, because for there to be so many open cases um, and it'd be that long to make that connection, I'd be curious to know how we got to there. Tracy, do you want me to start or you? <laughs> I think you're on mute, Tracy. I am on mute, okay. Um, I have some thoughts and we, we've taken a step with the passing of Molly Jane's law in the 2019 legislature, which um, in the state of, there is, a, there is a, a program called VICAP, the Violent Criminal Apprehension Program, which is run and administered by the FBI. And it was created to identify serial rapists and serial murderers back in the 1980s. And what Molly Jane's law does is it, it says that law enforcement shall use VICAP when they are investigating a sexual assault case. And basically go to VICAP, put in whatever details that you have, as many or as few, and it doesn't require DNA, so you're not waiting on a kit to be processed. But law enforcement does not naturally communicate with one another from one agency to the next. That's something I think a lot of people don't understand, that there's just not this natural cross communication from one agency to the next. And so VICAP will allow, so you've got an offender and you, you've got details of your case, you can go to VICAP, you can search based on the criteria, he rapes and he strangles, you know, you can um, search by name, and then you can look for other cases and see if they match up. And then you can talk to those other detectives and other agencies and see, are we looking at the same person? Because everything tells us, all the statisticians tell us that rapists don't generally rape one time. They rape again and again and again. And that there's a pattern generally with their behavior and they'll repeat that pattern. And oftentimes their pattern will escalate as it did in our case. He escalated from just raping and strangling to raping and killing. Um, and so he, he proves out what all the statistics have told us all along. Um, the other, so, so I hope to see VICAP become um, used widespread, that it just becomes a, um, you know, just another step in the investigative process. I hope to see other states making better use of it. It's a powerful tool, but if you don't use it, if you're not putting data into it, well, then it's not as powerful as it could be. Um, we, we know it works. We've identified an offender who was, you know, in Arlington, Texas and in Tyler, Texas, and two completely, they would have never found each other, had, was it not for VICAP. And when they finally identified him, he was linked to other cases, I believe even across state lines, and has now been indicted for sexual assault. So it works. But the other thing that I would really like to see happen you know, these CODIS hits that we talk about, and CODIS is the database for DNA, basically. And so when um, when a rape kit is processed and there's DNA in it, you know, they put that DNA into CODIS, and it's it's just this, you know, holding tank for DNA for, for a very simplified um, explanation. And what happened in our story is Melissa had a rape kit done, the DNA was put into CODIS. Well, so then the same offender rapes again in South Padre. That victim has a rape kit done. The DNA is put into CODIS and CODIS says, ding, 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 I know this DNA. It's the same, it's the same DNA. So it connects those cases. And all along, I have had this idea, I, for sure there's innocent DNA in CODIS. I mean, I, I don't know what this percentages are, but I'm very willing to acknowledge that innocent people's DNA ends up in CODIS. However, ending up in CODIS twice or three times or four times, it has to take the likelihood of being innocent down to almost a negligible percentage. And so, you know, CODIS hits, um, we, ha we had a CODIS hit where, you know, two agencies knew about one another it didn't prompt Plano to do anything differently. It didn't prompt them to say, oh, maybe she was telling the truth. Maybe she was actually raped and strangled. And it didn't give Cameron County, the DA had already said he wasn't gonna prosecute and he finds out about a CODIS hit, still not gonna prosecute. I don't get that. Um, but then in, in Allen, they, they, didn't, they received confirmation of whose DNA it was and sat on it for 41 days and didn't do anything. 
And so I would like to see something, and I don't know what it is, but when code hits happen, when you get confirmation that whatever suspect that you're looking at who is responsible for something significant and serious, you know, these, these girls were badly beaten and, you know, raped violently and so on, um, that there's some sort of process, procedure, protocol in place that means we're gonna respond definitively. We're not gonna just sit on it um, or it's not just gonna rest on one person's shoulders to decide is this worth looking at or not. Um, that that we, ha we have a, I don't know, an oversight committee. Uh, and I don't, again, I don't know what it looks like, but CODIS kits are serious and should be treated as such and responded to in a way that can save lives. There's, that's my thoughts. <laughs> Thank you, Tracy. So I would, um, and I think it kind of speaks to what Tracy's saying. Um, and we've talked about this a lot before. And obviously the change to VICAP is helpful and it's already been helpful, um, especially in a state such as big as Texas, right? Um, but actually in the state of Texas, we do have really good law. We have progressive law. If you look comparatively to other states, there are a lot of states that are lagging behind. I mean, and that's due in large parts to organizations like this. Um, you know, that do a lot of lobbying and get a lot of good legislation passed. Um, so for me, when I look at a systematic change, it's training issues. And we have laws about that, right? Our law enforcement is required to take specific training that is trauma-informed. We posted it for free um, in this county. Um, but I think when you listen to how Melissa was treated by that detective, those are training issues, right? Because it, instead of approaching it from a point of believing, it was approached from a point of how to unsolve this case or solve it in favor of this defendant who seemed to, um, at that time, not have anything else bad going on in his life, right? Um, and so that's a training issue. Um, as far as the CODIS hits go, um, you know, it's incumbent upon police officers or detectives to get it and say, okay, this is serious or... Um, this is why this matters, or this is why I can't just look at this DNA as, but I still don't know the rest of the facts, right? Or I need to look at it earlier than 41 days from now, right? So that is another, it's kind of a training issue. Um, I will say some of the issues in this particular case have already been solved um, a little bit with statutory changes, because at that time, um, at this time, currently, you wouldn't have this CODIS backlog issue that led to our situation in Allen um, because we now have statutes at the time, the very quick time that you have to turn around. There is not questions about processing. It is no longer up to an officer to decide whether you get your SANE exam or not, right? So those things have been addressed that I don't think that the Allen case would have happened the way it did already because of statutory changes. The other cases are for, I mean, Melissa's case and also the, the South Padre case. I mean, that's human error, right? That's people um, not evaluating the case in a way that led them to go forward and or took into account their seriousness. So that's training. Mm -hmm. um, uh, now, you know, to kind of piggyback off of like what they were saying, um, Policy reform, obviously, you know, that's great. Training problems or training issues or being um, trauma trained, like, or informed. I mean, you know, like, those are all very critical things. However, I think, you know, it, it kind of stems from, you know, a deeper problem a little bit. And that deeper problem is being a societal issue, right? And, you know, society views sexual assault, like society views sex as a very taboo topic, making sexual assault even more like taboo-er. Like I know that's not a word, but like you see where I'm going with that. And so like that's what, it makes it so much harder for, you know, uh, victims to like go forward with these cases because everybody has an idea of what a sexual assault is, right? Or what a sexual assault looks like. And so law enforcement, especially when they carry that, you know, pre-biased subconscious thoughts, and then they're now implanting it into their job, it affects how they perform their job and it affects how, you know, we as a society protect each other and how law enforcement protects and serves like what they're supposed to. <laughs> um, 
And so I think, you know, tying that back up, I, I think just like a society problem and just having these hard conversations with your friends and having these hard conversations with your peers, men especially, I mean, women too, because women can hold that like subconscious thought process and I've, I've witnessed it multiple times. Um, just having these hard conversations and calling your friends out. And I mean, if that means that you don't have to talk to these people anymore, so be it. Like, that's just one problem that you have, like one less problem that you have to deal with. Um, accountability, honestly, <laughs> at this point, like just being accountable and holding yourself accountable to what your morals are and how you want your friends to be treated or your, your neighbors or so on and so forth. I agree with that. And accountability without there having to be a relationship to that person. For sure. Is that they're a person. Yeah. Rose? Yes. I was just going to say, to, to piggyback what Melissa said, I, that is exactly where my mind was going. I, I agree that we do need training absolutely all the time, uh, for sure. Uh, and in addition, I think that there's a societal piece. There's this underpinning of societal norms and expectations that are at play, you know, and I think you have, and it's, and it's in our, it's, it's just insidious in our community and the systems, right? The systems and the programs make up members of the community. So then we have this community members who, like if I was to do a poll, I'd argue that a hundred percent of people in your community, wherever you are, maybe 99%, but I want to say a hundred percent would say rape is bad. We don't want rape to happen here. Yet, when a case is presented, a survivor discloses and describes to you just that, all of a sudden, there's this mass confusion as, and this Turner topsy-turvy thing that happens to survivors of, well, what were you doing? Well, y'all were talking. Well, y'all were this. So there is, I agree, Melissa, there is something deeper in our society that is preventing us and that is enabling these system failures. I think it's more than just one cop, more than just one DA, because they're members of that community and they have that nuanced belief that just continues. So I, I agree. I think it's there's a policy change and training absolutely necessary. And then there's this other piece that we need to have the courageous conversations about. And I think that's how we transform Texas slowly. I think that's how we start that pathway to survivor justice. Um, you know, again, sounds very lofty, but... Thank you, Melissa. That was beautifully said. I just Absolutely. To... Yeah, no, I always talk about how, like, you know, take away the sexual part, right? The sexual for assault, like, it could be just, like, a physical assault, right? Like, off the off the street. You get assaulted at a grocery store. You're not going to, when you report that, you're not going to get asked, like, oh, well, what aisle were you in? Or what <laughs> what were you wearing? Or whatever. It's, yes. it's Those questions are only implanted when there's sexual in front of it. And it's just, like, why is that energy not perceive the same when it's specifically this scenario. And Rose, I can kind of speak directly when you say, you know, if we took a poll, right, of everybody, because I pick juries for a living, right? Oh. And and I, um, we went through seven weeks of jury selection in uh, Molly's case before the defendant wanted to plead. And then so talk to almost 200 people and you're right, right? If you say, here's the law on sexual assault, um, do you agree with it? Yes. Do you agree that this is not consensual? Yes. Um, do you agree that you only have to say no once? Yes. I mean, all of those things, everybody agrees with that. And you can look at any trial board in any county in any state in this country and see people get found not guilty of adult sexual assault, sexual assault against children all the time. Now I will say um, every case, I mean, it, it's not due process and it's not the right legal system if every case goes forward to conviction and everybody gets a life sentence, right? Because everybody is not guilty. I mean, that's not, that can't be the way the system works or the system's not working, right? But you see that, yes, people want to say exactly what you're saying, Rose, that no, I don't want this and this is how I feel and no means no and all those things. But then when you do hear the other facts and scenarios, they can't wrap their heads around it, right? Um, just by very short anecdote, we had a case that went to trial a couple of weeks ago that was a sexual assault in a nursing home by a woman with Alzheimer's who actually is deceived by the time the case was going to trial and the defense was consent. And I just thought to myself, if we have to fight consent defenses when we're 100 and dead, like, I mean, you know, that is the society issue, right? Because that jury sat out and talked about that. Um, and 
so that I mean, so it, there is that society issue that it's not something that everybody thinks about the way that they they think they think about it. And so often you, you think about all of the the one the stories that make the big news, and so often the conversation goes to, oh no, not not him, surely mm -hmm. not. That's mm -hmm. not how I you know he's always been this way or. I've all, I just thought he was such a great guy. And, and it's that, that credibility thing where we're, it's so easy for us to find whoever it is being accused as credible. Like that is just our default. Well, the, they're credible. And, and we, we sort of just downplay that credibility of the accuser without even thinking about it. And, and I've really kind of been, I've read a book called Credible and it really helped kind of open my brain to, wow, that's how our brains really do kind of think about things. And you just have to retrain your brain and think, why in the world, what does anyone have to gain by reporting a sexual assault? I mean, you're basically setting yourself up for being treated like a liar and, you know, drugged through the mud and questioned about everything and the blame pointed back at you. And, you know, and when, when you understand that, you know, the false reporting of sexual assault is in line with any other false reporting of any other crime type, which is really small, like maybe 5%, 2 to 8%, something like that. Um, how great would it be if we could just default to the credibility of the accuser until something proves otherwise, you know, and let's just go down that path and be supportive and, and, and not ask all the questions that just don't need to be asked and just support them and, and not add to their trauma. And um, I mean, what a world would that be? <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. And just hearing y'all talk about it, like, it made me think of when people talk about this idea of the perfect victim, like, yes. like somehow we default to you must be the standard for us to believe what you're saying and to allow opportunity for your words to be heard outside of circumstance. But yes, thanks. I would, I would suggest that the perfect victim is the victim who is assaulted by the perfect stranger. You know, those, mm. those are way easier for us to, um, to stand beside when it, it is an absolute stranger situation. And, and that's just not the way it is most of the time. Most of the time it is somebody who is known in some capacity. And we just, we don't like to believe those. Yeah. So I'm going to take a moment for folks who are joining us live. Thank you so much for being part of the AMA. We still have one more question, but before we get to it, I just want to remind you, if you have any questions, please feel free to write them in the chat. We can populate them on the screen. Um, but yes, right now I look in the comments. I don't see any. Not any all on Facebook, not any all on YouTube. No questions? If not, we're going to go ahead and continue on to the last question. And if we have time at the end, we'll circle back. So the last question is, what is something you carry with you as you advocate and share your stories? I'll start. Um, <laughs> I am, um, when I found Molly's body, I discovered that she had a tattoo. I did not know she had a tattoo. Um, and it said beloved. And um, I was very aware even afterwards of like, here I'm standing looking at my daughter's dead body. And there is this word, this beautiful word staring back at me. And um, it really was a, a great source of comfort to me when I found out that she got that tattoo um, because she knew she was beloved in God's eyes. And that was really, um, I needed to hear that. That was really a very powerful in that journey, the early days of this tragedy. And so um, I, I'm not an anti-tattoo person. I took her brother to get a tattoo when he was 19 years old. Um, so uh, I didn't think I would ever be someone who would be tatted. However, um, I am, and I got the beloved tattoo and then I added her initials uh, a little bit after that, I thought it wasn't quite done. So um, anyway, 
that is, it is there. It's on my right hand. Uh, I call her my right hand and it's just a great reminder of, um, you know, of Molly and of, of this work that I have in, started doing on behalf of survivors of sexual assault. Um, similar to Tracy, I as well have a tattoo. <laughs> um, my tattoo is kind of big. It's like all over my side of here. I printed out a picture of it. Um, this is, I don't know if it's that clear. If you guys can see it. Yeah, yeah. it's great. Uh, so essentially this, reco this resembles recovery for me. Recovery of my assault. And um, so you see like this woman, right? She's naked, holding her body, just like vulnerable, hugging her vulnerable body, right? So that just, that already says a lot within itself. Um, you know, that just shows to me, that just shows like your body is your temple kind of thing. Um, your body is worthy of love, um, of so much. And the flowers, just like earth, kind of, it resembles like life. Um, as so many people probably are aware, like, so when it comes to surviving a sexual assault, you struggle a lot mentally. And that's just kind of a thing that you deal with for the rest of your life, PTSD, depression, I mean, just so on and so forth. And so for me, the flowers resemble life. Um, you know, I struggle with suicidal thoughts. And so it's just this constant, like, ever nourishing, this ever evolving, you're constantly, you're growing, you're going to have days when your flowers, your petals may fall, per se, but it'll keep growing, it'll keep coming back, it'll, it, it, it's, you know, it, it resembles life, and it's just like the circle of life, and I mean, um, I love it. <laughs> and I would say for me, I carry around the voices of all these moms, um, <laughs> mom. I have four kids. In fact, when I met Tracy, I had an eight month old <laughs> who is now um, in about to go into kindergarten. Um, and I don't ever in the job that I do, I don't typically get to meet the victims of the cases um, because typically they've tragically been killed. And I did intimate partner violence work for a huge amount of years. And I didn't get to meet any of those women, but I meet all their moms um, and I meet all their moms on their very worst day. And even for Melissa, I've met Melissa's mom. <laughs> I've hugged Melissa's mom. Um, and it's important to me because obviously for wherever a case goes or however a case is going, um, I get to hear what these women and these people mean to their moms and what a hole it's left in their life to not have their child anymore. And so I can always hear Tracy's voice in the back of my head and saying, do better, do better, do better. <laughs> Um, because I make tough choices, right? And I don't make choices that are always the most popular because I have to evaluate, unfortunately, things that not everybody has to look at. I have to look at the law and I do have to look at trauma going forward and I do have to look at whether or not something can be successful. Um, and sometimes that leads to an unpopular decision. But um, I know that I have an audience of Tracy's and Diane Getram's and people behind me who are saying, do better, don't let this offender proceed. Don't let this victim be stuck out there. Um, and so I carry all, and I can, I can just see so many mom's faces um, in front of me. So I carry those feelings and those words with me into every case so that I know that even if I am having to make tough decisions, that I am doing it in the most informed way and, and doing it the absolute best I can um, to make sure that I'm honoring the victims and also um, and holding an offender accountable to the extent that I can. Thank you. Thank you all for your response and how you carry and how you continue. And thank you all for your answers and sharing your stories and being vulnerable here with us. Um, so we're about to wrap up, but we have a question from the audience. I'm gonna populate it in. Have either of y'all had a chance to speak to the police departments that fell short and didn't believe the victims? I think I might be the only one who gets to say yes on that. Oh, wow. Is that fair, Tracy and Melissa? Yeah. I mean, Melissa obviously spent a lot of time talking to those poli the, the Plano Police Department in her case. Mm -hmm. And obviously, poli Plano Police Department had a, another role in this case because they did 
investigate the death of Megan Guthrum and that detective was a different detective and he did an outstanding job. Um, but yes, I had to talk to all of them because I was proceeding forward with a trial. Um, and I was going to have to call a lot of people as witnesses, the police departments, um, crime scene officers, patrol officers. Um, I will say I never spoke to the detective um, in Melissa's case, except for the time that I asked him to get a warrant. Um, and uh, after that, I didn't talk to him again because I couldn't see a scenario where the state of Texas was calling him to the witness stand. Um, I had some thoughts about cross-examining him, um, but I did speak quite at length with the Allen Police Department, um, and that is that is a wholesale system failure in terms of timing. Um, you know, it, it it would it just because of the way the the CODIS hits came in and the backlog happened. It that you know that's what happened there. Um, we have talked to the South Padre Police Department who did everything right, um, and, and they were obviously great. I, I've never spoken to the prosecutor or been able to specifically identify who made that choice down in Cameron County not to accept that case. So I don't, I don't know their choice on that. Um, you know, I think, I think people look back and they can say to you things like hindsight's 2020. You know, I mean, I think that that's kind of an easy excuse, right? Um, to use that kind of phraseology, um, these, but in terms of talking to the same nurses that saw Melissa or the patrol officers, they all still um, in 2022 remembered her case because it was traumatic, because they believed her, because they themselves could not believe the case did not go forward. Those were the people that were gonna testify um, and so when we think about systematic issues, there are people in the system who get it, right? Um, unfortunately, sometimes decision makers are not, are not people. Um, so yes, I have had the opportunity to talk to all of those people. <laughs> um, I don't know that, I don't know that Tracy uh, or Melissa ever have. No, I, there has been no communication. Um, I do hope one day that I will have the opportunity to sit down and talk with them. Um, maybe I hope that I have the opportunity to sit down and they can listen to me. Um, it's maybe the, the way that I uh, would prefer it. Um, I do want, as I think about, cause you know, all the failures, all the failures and in contrast in, in speaking with, um, the South Padre victim and her experience with law enforcement there and how in the immediate aftermath, and she was, you know, high trauma and like, I just want to go home. That was sort of her, like, I, I can't do this. I just want to go home. And her detective said to her, don't you want to make sure he doesn't do it to someone else? And she, you know, she said, yes. And he said, then let's get him. And she said she knew the entire time that he stood by her, that they believed her. And I mean, I have chills saying those words because that is all a victim needs to hear. You know, as hard as that entire process is to know that you have this person, this person of authority is like, I believe you, we're going to work this case and it's going to be long and it's going to be hard, but we are going to work together. And, you know, that is monumental. And so I just think what a beautiful contrast. <laughs> of how that went, you know, in that it, the DA didn't do what they should have, but the, the detectives did. And I, so I just wanted to highlight that. Yeah. For my situation, I, I, I wish, you know, obviously I wish that I was believed, right? <laughs> like obviously. Right. But, you know, and now that everything is all said and done and Plano PD is still saying words such as alleged so on and so forth it's just you know after this guilty plea it's just like okay do you still not believe it is is this not enough like what more do i have to do like am i not enough was my life not valuable enough for you to actually like do something um you know so that's kind of like what i struggle with um that's been the most frustrating thing about this entire experience is the fact that it's still somehow like dragging out 
uh, now that, you know, he, he is going to be in prison for the rest of his life. So, you know, there, that's one less perpetrator on the streets, but it's just like, almost like, okay, well, now we have to worry about Plano. And they're almost just as much as a perpetrator as Kimber was, if I'm being 100% honest, because they're still saying all these things. And it's, it's just frustrating. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. And it's probably a continuous struggle, but yeah. Hope for you, Melissa. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So on that, um, I don't see any further questions in the comments. So Rose, I'm going to pass to you to close. I just wanted to say y'all though, thank you for joining for part two for National Crime Victims Week. Um, yeah, Rose. Thank you, uh, Courtney, and thank you, Elena, Tracy, and Melissa. And I know Katie couldn't be here, but we honor her story as well, which was very similar to what we've heard, you know, that wasn't believed, uh, adult sexual assault survivor, you know, all those things and was failed um, as well. Um, my, my hope for, for, for us and for if there's anybody watching, I know that most of your members, but I know that we will record this and someone else may watch it. So if your members that, you know, chances are you were doing this work and that's amazing and we're glad to have everybody here. But for those who may watch this and have no idea or do not are not in the realm of sexual assault or not in the realm of work and the work that we do. I, what I hope that, that, that you all get out of this is that when someone discloses to you that they have been a victim of sexual assault, just start by believing, validate what you're hearing. The only question that should come out of your mouth is how can I help you? Can I help you here? You know, that is it, that simple, simple little things that we can do to begin to make a small difference in the lives of survivors. You know, as, as the panel member said, systemic change, it's, it's hard to do. And you've got some systems that are working like the South Padre case sounds to be a good example of law enforcement, stellar. Everything about it was, and it just didn't make it through to the um, prosecution side of things. Um, but, but I feel like, I think at the end of the day, accountability is really up to the survivor and, and what they feel like they, what they want. Uh, and also with systems, if that's the route that's taken, we report it and their systems, even if the outcome is such as, as Elena said, we're not gonna get hundred percent all the time. Even if the outcome isn't as such, I think that as long as survivors are treated with dignity and respect every step of the way, that uh, is worth more than sometimes even the outcome or equally as important is from what we anecdotally speaking, when we talk to survivors, that's super important. And that some of them most are not afforded that dignity um, or, or that respect. And then I think it's, as we talked earlier about the multi-prong approach to prevention, the multi-prong approach to how do we begin to change societal norms and things like that to really go from, yes, this is bad to like, Yes, this is bad, and I believe you, and and we're going to do something about this. You know, um, I, I think of one egregious, and it happened in Austin back. I can't remember, 2016, maybe 2015. It was two University of Texas football players. Um, Charlie Strong was the head coach then, and I will say this: uh, they they were um, they were uh, they raped, uh, sexually assaulted uh, another student there. Uh, there was video evidence of that. It went to trial. They were acquitted. But uh, because, uh, because of all the things we've been talking about. Uh, but the thing that I was very pleased with is uh, Charlie Strong, again, the head coach at that time at UT, he immediately kicked them off the football team. Didn't right. care. Wasn't one of those to say, well, let's wait till the justice system handles or let's wait till this. He said that is unacceptable. In other words, I believe the survivor and you are off the team. And I that gives me hope uh, with people like that. Um, and, 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 and the survivors and their strength. And I take that with me at every table I sit. Now that I'm at different tables, it's those injustices that come. I try to channel them as best as I can uh, for survivors of sexual assault. So again, thank y'all so much for sharing this story. Tracy, Melissa, Elena, I know that this was not easy. And um, we're really you know closing out Victims' Rights Week with a nice um, 
shebang, if you will, <laughs> and also Sexual Assault Awareness and Prevention Month in Texas is, is closing, is winding down slowly. So thank you all so much for, for, for sharing your information and for doing what you do. Uh, and thank you all for watching. And, and Courtney, thank you for even making Tasa have an AMA. Again, I thought it was American Music Awards at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, just echoing what Rose said, thanks y'all so much. Thank you for having us. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Thank you for the opportunity. Yes. Bye, everyone.